Good morning. Welcome to Walnut Grove Presbyterian Church Online Worship. We're David and Goliath, Jesus' first two disciples. If you don't know, can't remember, think it's funny, or know the reference, you're where you're supposed to be. But today we're going to talk about uh, some people in Scripture who thought no way and never for Jesus and the cross. Now, there are modern people that, famous people we know, and that thought that way. One was Christopher Hitchens, who just a few years ago passed away. But he was an outspoken atheist. In fact, I heard him say on a uh, in a television interview of some sort that he's told his friends that if he if they heard that on his deathbed he he accepted Christ as his savior to disregard it, uh, as he looked into eternity and maybe was in pain and he called out to the Lord for salvation. They were to disregard it. He was very outspoken. In fact, he equated Christianity to leaving loaded guns all over the street. Now, um, I've never thought, I've never been afraid that on my deathbed, I would advocate for leaving loaded guns all over the street where children play. I'm not sure if that's one of your fears. But he was afraid that he would turn to the Lord. Um, his, I believe his story is his sister died and he prayed for her to be saved uh, while she was sick and she wasn't. So I don't know if he really didn't believe in God or he was just shaking his fist at God and saying, because you didn't do this, I'm not going to believe in you. Um, I think his brother was a outspoken Christian and always prayed for his, you know, his unbelieving brother to, uh, to be saved. But, uh, but there are people in the Bible who were uh, like this as well. When, they, when it was the notion of Jesus and the cross was brought up, they, they said, never, this will never happen. And I'm talking about Jesus' disciples. Uh, the story today is Peter. And uh, what, what happens with Peter when Jesus explains the truth of the gospel, the first time Peter hears the gospel, he says, never Never, no way, let that never happen, Lord. Here's the situation. Jesus was talking with his disciples, and he asked, who do people say the Son of Man is? And he was referring to himself. And this is in Matthew 16, verse 13. And in 14, Matthew goes on to say, they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And then Jesus turns it to them. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. So he believes Jesus is the Messiah, and he's the first one to confess his faith like this in the, the room of the disciples. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Faith comes from God. And uh, after this, Jesus explains the gospel clearly. They understand he's the Messiah, the Son of God. So he very plainly says, and this is our, where our chapter picks up, or our passage today picks up in Matthew 16, starting in verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And here's the passage I was referring to, verse 22. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. So what... Did you think, did you remember or really put the two and two together? This is where Jesus speaks plainly, not in parables to the disciple. Explain salvation history, the culmination of salvation history, him, the Messiah, the Son of God. And they, they just, they don't want any of it. They don't want any of it. And Jesus says very famously, Verse 23, Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Okay, so Peter wasn't totally rejecting God or wasn't mad at God per se, although 
I think he, you know, he's maybe he maybe that's an unfair thing to say. Maybe he is a little bit mad at God because of all this. It's this kind of thing where he loves Jesus and he doesn't want anything. He doesn't want to mix faith and, uh, you know, this Jesus movement, uh, God's messianic age, doesn't want to mix that with being uncomfortable in any way. Do you know anybody like that? Any churches like that? Any denominations like that who uh, will discard the word of God or God's teaching because it seems somehow uh, uncomfortable or, or difficult or not the easy way? <laughs> Yeah, I, I know. Sometimes it seems like politeness just, you know, gets in the way of um, so much of the uh, of the Christian life. We, you know, we want to be acceptable, and you know, the Bible says, "Woe to you when all men speak well of you." Well, let's hear what Jesus' response is to this way of thinking. And twenty four, he says, then. Matthew writes, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, and take up their cross, and follow me. So we're all to take up our cross. True love is not about always being polite and inoffensive. True love is about being loving, um, no matter how it might at first come across. It's about being genuine. Jesus continues in 25, who, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Do you know anybody who it seems like they've forfeited their soul uh, for some material thing, uh, for some worldly thing? And it's usually not even a whole lot, you know. I mean, it's it's just such a it's just such a such a poor trade, <laughs> such a poor strategy. Um, it seems like just so futile. And this this is God's perspective, and hopefully it's ours as well. In verse twenty-seven, for the Son of Man, for the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and He will reward each person according to what they have done. So the person who has a very difficult walk and living God's life is very difficult for them um, and has lots of persecutions, they'll be rewarded accordingly. It won't just be for nothing. There's, um, there's, a, there's a system, uh, evidently. And Jesus continues in verse 28. Truly I tell you, some, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, and I believe Luke's gospel, it's fulfilled right after this. Uh, Peter, James, and John, I believe, go up on the mountain of transfiguration, and there is Jesus in all his glory and his kingdom glory. And there's Elijah and there's Moses also glorified. And uh, then the heavens open and God praises Jesus as he's doing everything right. And he loves him. He's my, his beloved son and he's well pleased. And uh, just Jesus is accepted by God, blessed by God. So that's Jesus coming into his kingdom. And you know, the disciples get to see this peak as Jesus is heading towards the cross. And the cross is he's going to sacrifice himself for the salvation of all of us. The exchange, it's called the divine exchange, where he takes on all our sin and we get to take on all his glory and all the favor God would show Jesus in the acceptance and the elevation and is just put on to us, we can, we can exchange it rather than anything we would a worldly thing. There's a lady in Elizabethan who found out that kids, when they're taken away out of a home uh, because of a terrible situation, that the uh, social services just would put them in the uh, in the meeting room, and it was dirty, and they'd just be on this cold linoleum floor. And she was so offended by that that she decided to open up the I, what she called the Isaiah 117 house, and it was a place where kids could 
take a take a bath, take a shower, get clean clothes, whether they were a toddler or a teenager, had toys, it was comfortable. It was just a nice transition for the maybe four to six hours before they were um, put into emergency uh, foster care. Um, and I think there's one that's going to be opened up to Johnson City or Bristol, Tennessee. Um, it's, it's moving closer. Um, surely she won't lose her reward. What about you? What uncomfortable thing have you done uh, for the Lord? You know, something that took you off the couch, <laughs> where you uh, where you picked up a cross. It was a difficult burden. It was a sacrifice for someone else. Uh, Jesus says to all of us, "Who do you say I am? What about you? Are we gonna are we gonna pick up our cross? We're we gonna sacrifice to others uh, as Jesus would have us do and gain our lives." Um, I'm sure he's put something in your heart. And if you're not sure about faith, and if you're not sure, um, but just something is strange, or you have this feeling, um, Jesus said, you know, I stand at the door and knock. Knock on the door of your heart. And of course, your heart doesn't really have a door. It has valves, <laughs> and it has walls. But, uh, you know, it's a spiritual thing, and we hear God. Maybe not with our ears, maybe with our spiritual organs. You can feel God trying to enter into yourself, Him offering you faith. It's a free gift, but you have to receive it and begin your life leaving selfishness and envy and pride, leaving all that behind and taking on as a new identity, um, being a Christian, a little Christ, taking on love and sacrifice for others and kindness, and wisdom, and a God view perspective along with a kind of a designer, divine soul, a <laughs> spirit. Um, and everybody liked Jesus. Even the people who weren't like Jesus, liked Jesus. And the people that didn't like Jesus. Um, and maybe this is why Christopher Hitchens was so worried that he might be uh, that he might follow Christ, is all these people Jesus tells the disciples are going to execute him. The elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, a lot of them after his death and resurrection are going to come to faith. We read about it in, the, in Acts and in the Gospel of John. The one who hated Jesus the most, the Apostle Paul, he's going to come to faith. The last thing he wanted to do uh, was come to faith in Jesus Christ. And he does. And he ends up writing most of our New Testament. And he starts so many churches. And uh, he really takes up his cross and follows Jesus. And uh, he pays the price, but he's a loving person. And he's a selfless person. And his reward isn't, isn't in this world. Just like our reward isn't in this world. This isn't our home. Our reward is in our heavenly home. That's the place of no death and no sickness and even no sin. Imagine all the people, all God's children together in this big city and there's no sin. <laughs> nobody's yelling, nobody's beeping, nobody's angry. Just, just God's love beaming through every heart. It's... Uh, it's our true home. It's, you know, we should, there, there's nothing on this earth that should lead us to expect that or, or to strive for that or to want that. But that's, that's our true home and that's what our heart desires. So if you think you're ready to accept Jesus Christ, if you're afraid, but now you feel this this knocking on the door of your heart, you feel like the love of God is maybe coming into your life. Um, I'll offer you the option to accept Jesus Christ by faith, by confessing your faith aloud, and we'll use together the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let's confess our faith together. Believers and new believers alike using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you come to us and you partner with us and you want to adopt us as your own children, even though we don't deserve it. We praise you that Jesus Christ came to earth and was willing to sacrifice himself to take up the cross, literally take up his cross, so that we might be forgiven of all of our sins and might be acceptable as your children, even though we don't deserve it. Lord, this wonderful place you have for us in heaven is beyond anything we could understand or imagine. It is just so good, but it was very expensive. And Jesus Christ paid the debt, made the way for us to get there, and we just praise you, Lord. We thank you for our faith, and we pray for those who do not yet believe. We pray that you'll touch their hearts, and they'll accept you and accept a life of love and sacrifice for others. Lord, surround us with peace and with faith and with health. Be with those who need you. And we pray to you as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, thanks for joining us for worship. We love you, but not as much as God loves you. Have a great week.